Hi everyone, I'm your host Yuvia Ivanova. Welcome to the third part of our interview with Daniel Jeffries. In this episode, we talk about Daniel's best altcoin investment strategy and understanding the curve of technological development and adoption. To get the show notes from this episode, go to cryptoradio.io slash daniel3. To hear the first and second part of this interview, go to cryptoradio.io slash daniel1 and cryptoradio.io slash daniel2. This episode is brought to you by bitguild.io. Bitguild is a new gaming platform built using blockchain technology. Their mission is to redefine the relationship between gamers and game developers. On the Bitguild platform, gamers maintain full ownership and control of their virtual items, which are stored on the blockchain. They can transfer items and progress between compatible games, and they can make in-game transactions safely and cheaply, and sometimes free. Developers who join the platform will get a direct link to an established player base with a strong community and a network of like-minded developers building on the same platform. Developers will also have the potential for direct game development funding from BitGuild. The first version of the BitGuild portal is now live. You can log in with MetaMask, buy the Plat token, and play BitGuild's first game, Ether Online. They now have a full inventory wallet system for in-game items. In the coming weeks, the marketplace will be implemented, and several independent developers are joining the site to bring their unique games to the BitGuild family. Go to cryptoradio.io slash play to start playing and join the BitGuild official Discord server to connect with the team. Welcome to Crypto Radio. We interview the top thinkers and entrepreneurs in the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. We also cover topics like trading, investing, and ICOs. We're your hosts, Mike Gilliland, Michael Pohl, Chris Sparks, and UVI Benova. We're entrepreneurs, crypto investors, and co-founders of a new blockchain investment platform called CoSyndicate.io. We created CoSyndicate and Crypto Radio to make crypto investing a better experience for you. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to CryptoRadio.io slash start. If you like our podcast, you can subscribe, share and follow us on social media and leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. You can find all those links at CryptoRadio.io slash start. Well, you wrote this uh, book about mastering shitcoins, so maybe we can talk about that for a bit. Sure, Mastering Shitcoins is one of my most popular articles of all time. And I've not yet woven it into a book, but I will. And I also did the podcast on it. So that's the, the Daily Post Human, which you can see on dailyposthuman.com. And it is what I call my mini VC strategy. And so this is a strategy where you are not trading regularly. It is more of a buy and long-term hold strategy with the added advantage of actually having a plan to sell. Uh, most buy and hold is more of a kind of tribal awareness, like which is more like a survival instinct. And buy and hold is great, but not when you're going to burn all of your cash, right? You actually have a plan to sell, whether that's two years or five years or 10. So Mastering Chick Coins was more about again, what I call the mini VC strategy. And if you think about how VCs invest their money, what they generally do is take a portfolio of maybe 20 or 30 different companies that they're putting their money into. Maybe they're putting a million dollars into those 30 companies. They fully expect 80 to 90% of those companies to be worth practically nothing or go to zero. Let's pretend that it's 80% goes to zero. And a company can go bad for any reason, just like a, a project can go bad for any reason. It could be personalities. It could be somebody gets hit by a bus. It could be somebody gets sick of the project and leaves a key developer. It could be relationships. It could be it was too ambitious. It could be the founders are at each other's throat. It could be a divorce. It could be anything that kills a company or a project. But even if it was a tremendous idea and you had great people and all the funding in the world. So 80% just pew, knocked out of existence. The other 10% are the ones that are good performers. Maybe they're not the rock stars. They're not the ones that go to the moon, the one you read about. They're not the one that makes somebody famous. But they're good performers. They're a good return on investment. The last 10% is really the ones that kind of go crazy. They go to the moon. That's the one, the rocket ship. The rocket ship is then the one that really makes up for all of those, that 80% loss. And so really, 
that is the strategy for VCs. They have a very long time horizon. The amateur ones have it at about three years. The longer ones have it at five, eight, or 10 years time frame, which is a very long period of time that most people are not comfortable with. But the general strategy, I would say, is you look at the different categories of coins that are out there. So you're looking at something like platform coins. These are ones that are trying to build the internet, the next wave of the internet, a centralized version of the internet. Where So that, that's where things like Ethereum and NEO, IOTA, EOS, uh, uh, that's where those waves, all those types of things, that's where those platforms live. Those are the most complex things to build. They're very challenging. They're going to take a long time to get right. We are reinventing the wheel in many cases, and we have nothing to go on. We're inventing something out of nowhere. People get very impatient nowadays, and they say, oh, well, crypto's been around eight years, and nothing's happened. Yeah, artificial intelligence was around 50 before anything happened, right? We are very impatient today with the change rate of progress, and that's just not historically how things work things go through a series of iterations and changes. So home video recording is a category of technology and Betamax, VHS, LaserDisc, DVD, Blu-ray, DVR are iterations of that technology. Each one improves upon the past, right? And we are very much in the Model T era here, the Betamax era of this technology. So these are platform coins are going to take their time. There are also things that are function more like currencies uh, or either a precious behave like a precious metal, like a Bitcoin or, or a spender style coin that is going to be moved around a lot more. And then there's also the privacy coins, you know, Monero and things like that, that are more acting like analogs to cash. So there are currencies, there's a basket of that. There are utility coins, which are more like, you know, FinTech coins, for instance, like XLM, those types of things where you can kind of consume a basket of those. There will be security coins, and I think they're going to be incredibly popular, that the regulation and all the moves that have to happen at a societal level for that to be the case are in motion now, and it's a slow process. But eventually, many, many assets will be tokenized and securitized. And the, the template laws are already on the books in places like Delaware, which is the business capital of the world in many respects, uh, or business capital in America for sure. And, and in many ways, the world, there are other centers like uh, Switzerland and, and Singapore and such. But that tends to act as a kind of litmus test for how the laws will eventually function at the federal level. And there's a reason everyone kind of incorporates in Delaware. They have all the judges and all the people are incredibly trained in corporate law and how these things work. The entire court system is totally streamlined for it. It's really this specialty. And that's been the history of the United States in that each different state acts as like a lab for larger federal laws. So we will get there. Security coins will be a basket. So it's really by picking a number of the projects in each of these categories, buying some of them, and basically just hanging out to them for five years or more. And uh, I think that can be a very effective strategy for the average investor who would like to dabble in crypto, but not necessarily make it a full-time job, like being a, a day trader or even a swing trader. Just something where you don't want to try to develop an algorithmic system. That is a very effective algorithm that has worked historically over time. Uh, there's no guarantee. And Maybe all the projects go to bust, but this is part of my strategy. And uh, about, I would say, 20 to 30% of my portfolio in crypto lives in that particular strategy. Yeah, it's been my strategy as well. And uh, I think in the crypto space, things move a bit faster than in the VC world. So that time frame may be shorter to see returns. But ultimately, like you said, with a lot of these platform coins, it is going to take a few years before we see a real functioning product. A lot of these ICOs are are being raised on an idea. Maybe not so much this year. It's um, People are getting a bit more serious and they at least have you know an alpha version of the platform ready. But still, it's going to be a while before they're actually functioning and have millions of users and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's so early. The crypto assets are so small and people think, oh, it's too late. I already missed, you know, the big run. No, you did not. <laughs> you, you didn't. 
it is so early in this space and there are so many things that have to happen. When you look at even the basics, right, of how some of these applications will work. I, I was excited about EOS recently because there's a debate about, oh, is it, you know, is it too centralized? Well, it's like, look, these are all iterations. We're still figuring out consensus technology. It's imperfect. We're not there yet. So I'm willing to let all these different consensus protocols play out. Okay. Eventually we'll hit on, we'll have hundreds of them and we'll hit upon the two or three best ones. Okay. We, it's not just proof of work and proof of stake. There will be hundreds of other ones that nobody has even thought of yet. So give that time. But I was interested in them because I felt like maybe there was a real competition with Ethereum for once. And they'd also push the rock forward on a few things, right? They had like the idea that you could have an application where the developer pays for your ability to use it. So that means you could theoretically just go to an app store, download an application and use it without actually loading any crypto into it. The developer is going to pay for you to do it. To me, that makes perfect sense because if you look at how the way it's developing right now, you would have to go get on an exchange, get KYC'd, wire money from your bank account into the exchange, buy a utility coin, move it to a wallet, download an application, top off your application to do something. That is a non-starter. It's just a non-starter. It will never, mark my words, it will never, never work like that in the real world. Okay. The way that EOS said it succinctly was if you went to the Amazon web page and it cost you three cents to load the page, you would never load the page. Okay. So this kind of early adopter stuff that we're all willing to deal with because we're techies or have a, a background. I, if you don't understand what I'm saying, then go find a relative, your mother, your brother, your sister, your best friend, try to walk them through that process. If you can do it in less than two weeks, you are a freaking genius, okay? So the average consumer is not going to function like that. There are so many little quirks and hurdles to how this technology is developing, and it is going to take time for these best practices and standards and things to play out, and people have got to be patient. Somebody once said that the market is designed to take money from impatient people and give it to patient people. If you're going to burn one thing into your brain from this podcast, burn that into your brain. Yeah. And even the blockchain technology itself, you know, it's been such an overhyped word that even IC companies are changing their name to blockchain IC and their stock is going up in price because people are so crazy about just the word blockchain. But it might end up being like it's plausible that blockchains might just be the MySpace of this technology space. Like maybe we'll come up with something better, more efficient, you know, faster, more decentralized, more user-friendly, whatever. It might be that blockchains won't even be around in another couple of years, but some second, third, fourth generation technology will be. I agree 100%. I actually have a talk about this where I say that blockchain is actually a, a limiting frame on you, the way that you think about this technology. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that there is a difference between a category of technology and an iteration of the technology. And the reason most people struggle to predict the future is they focus on the iteration of the technology. They look at Betamax and they go, oh, it's, it won't record long enough and it's kind of ugly, like it'll never work. But the way the technology develops, they project that kind of indefinitely into the future. But the way the technology develops is the people who are the engineers are looking at the flaws in the current iteration and thinking, how do I solve that? And that's what the next iteration moves the rock forward a little bit. The category always succeeds. It's the iterations that fail. In fact, no historical technology really fails like as a category. Whenever I challenge people to go back and look at technology and find me like an actual technology that failed, like when I see these snarky, snarky articles about blockchain and crypto are going nowhere. I'm like, go find me an actual technology that failed, like steam-powered things, you know, steam-powered engines. You can point out 30 iterations that failed. You will never be able to point out a category of a technology that has failed. You just can't do it because it, it doesn't exist. You can point to 
a plane crash. You can point to AT&T's lines going down in a mass communication network. You can point to a bridge collapse. But those are individual iterations, bridges, planes, mass communication survives in its platonic form. In, in, it, it iterates. And blockchain to me is an iteration. It is the first spark of fire in the caveman of this new world, right? It is not the end all be all. It is the first solution to an uns previously unsolvable problem, right? Zuku's triangle of, you know, you can't have it human understandable plus decentralized. I'm not sure what the third part is right now, but again, there's this problem we couldn't solve. We could only put two of the pieces of the triangle together, right? And Bitcoin comes along and solves for all three parts. So then everybody kind of leaps out of that space. They go, oh, this previously unsolvable problem. Now I know how to solve it. And they leap into what I call the Satoshi box, right? They go and they solve the problem in the exact same way. They say, this is the only way we can ever solve this, right? That is nonsense. It is not how it will work. We'll have what I call, I call this decentralized consensus technology. Now it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue like blockchain, but it is decentralized consensus technology. It is a way for large groups of folks without a central authority able to make decisions collectively, including different parts of the group that agree, different parts that don't agree, and different parts that are hostile. It is an entire system of entities and people making a decision about how to do things collectively. That is what this revolution is really about. It is making decisions across a long distance. And blockchain is really just the first, most brute force, most basic method. It is very effective, but it is entirely likely it will not exist. It might exist for a very specific purpose or as a subset, but we are already starting to see different groups come up with different technologies in terms of how it functions. I just interviewed Radix and I'm writing an article on them now. Uh, and they have a slogan, blockchain, your days are numbered. They are already claiming that they can get to visa level transactions right now with the technology. And they're about to release their, I think their full alpha in June or so. And uh, they've been working on it for six years. And they've iterated through different versions where they've failed and they tried blockchain and they tried an alternative to blockchain and that didn't work. And so they just kept iterating and iterating and came up with their own piece of the technology. And you're seeing other groups do this as well. This is largely inevitable. It is about being flexible and understanding that this is a process. And it could be a process that takes, yeah, it moves faster, uh, but it could be, it could be 20 or 30 years. Honestly, it really, we're going to see killer apps earlier than that, lower hanging fruit apps than that, you know, in, in the next couple of years, five years, right? And we're going to start to see use cases, good and bad, for the technology it as it exists today in the next decade. But really, maybe the true revolution is 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now. We all like to think the singularity is near and we're accelerating towards this, like, techtopia. To me, as a sci-fi writer, I love that stuff. It's great. It goes into all my novels. But as a practical, free-thinking individual... I think it's probably nonsense, right? And a lot of folks are going to come to the end of their life and be very disappointed when they die like everybody else, right? We're accelerating. I don't think we're quite at the like super takeoff stage. These technologies are still going to take a practical amount of time to really change the way the world works. It could be a hundred years. Yeah. I think some of the industries that are notoriously known for adopting new technologies like gambling, gaming, porn are probably going to be the ones where we see those killer apps because the appeal of the applications in those industries often don't have much to do with the underlying technology itself. They rely more on the excitement, which kind of smooths out any glitches or problems. I think that excitement actually in, in those industries is exactly why people are so tolerant 
to these kind of like half functioning apps, you know, like game physics is a <laughs> a popular kind of meme generating area where just games work poorly, but people enjoy them anyway, because it's hilarious. So it's very possible that blockchain will see, you know, killer apps in, in those areas. But people talk about governments using blockchains or, you know, them being used in the medical industry in these kinds of critical applications. I think it will be a while before we see them. I was in Oslo a couple weeks ago and I spoke in front of a room of politicians and investors like the Minister of Foreign Development of Norway was there and I was talking about blockchain and he asked me like well do you think that we should be using blockchain in our elections and I said no it's just too early like this is a baby technology like it's just taking its first steps it's not ready to be used in something serious like governments but give it some time it's gonna get there maybe or maybe there will be another iteration but because we have the internet now and things spread so fast and because there's a financial application in this technology people got really really excited about it early on and we kind of got ahead of ourselves i think in where it actually is i think i wrote it in the beginning of one of my articles like so the bubble popped and the naysayers were right and i said good and then i said well have i become a naysayer like did i do i agree that bitcoin is worthless and all this and, and the answer is no it's just that with all this frothy excitement it became hard for people to focus on actually developing the damn applications and making them useful. And there's this brutal spotlight on them at all times, right? This fear and, oh my God, what if it takes over the world and like crashes all of the world currency? Hang on there, cowboys. Like this is the human insanity meter kicking up a bunch, right? The fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This crazy that kind of goes along with anything, right? It's speculation. We've got to stop this thing. Just shut up. Calm down. Sit the fuck back. It's okay. Like, and so I actually, for me, when it sort of deflated, despite I love a, a good bubble boom like anybody, I like raking it in and feeling like I'm a genius. It really is good for the industry. The industry needed to have that kind of spotlight taken back so that people can keep working on the whiteboard, they can keep working on the code, they can keep making mistakes and, and iterating through ideas. This is going to take some time. People need to have patience. And yeah, the, the internet and mass communication technology really magnifies this stuff and, and just makes it feel like we're accelerating all the time and going faster and faster. And we really are just not. I mean, we are in some respects... But technology takes a long time. It, it really does. When you think about, I think I used an example in one of my articles of like Velcro. The guy had the idea for Velcro, you know, seeing these barbs that stuck to his friend's sweater when they were on a hike. And it was 10 years of him going through materials and developing it. And then it was another 10 years to kind of perfect it and build a company. And then when he launched the company, he thought, bam, easy street, baby, that, you know, the orders are going to roll in. Right. And then it's another five years before NASA was looking at it and they were about to put men on the moon. And they were like, it's really hard to get people in and out of these spacesuits with like laces or zippers. What are we going to do? And they found Velcro. And that was the beginning. So it was 25 years from conception to reality. That is realistic. The, the human time scale has not changed, even with artificial intelligence and all of these things speeding up our ability to do certain things. Real innovation, real solutions take time. Our artificial intelligences are not smart. They're pattern matching systems. They solve a problem in the exact same way that it's always been solved. But a human is still unique. And then if they want to put someone on the moon, they can take everything they've ever learned abstract away the core platonic vision of that, design two or three possibilities of how to get there, and then design an exact, precise solution that has never existed before to land that rocket on the moon. That is something that the computers don't do well yet. That is something the average person doesn't do well. That is a true breakthrough. And these things are rare and they take time despite what a bunch of kind of nonsense and, and reports are telling you that, uh, you know, the AIs are rising up and having emergent consciousness. We, we've had a tremendous amount of acceleration in machine intelligence and exactly zero 
uh, percent success and evolution in machine consciousness, zero. And in the same way, uh, when it comes to crypto technology, there are some brilliant breakthroughs and there are many breakthroughs to come that are going to take a, a genius staring at a whiteboard and drinking Red Bulls uh, 24 hours a day for five years to solve. Yeah, I think there's also an element of being in the right place at the right time. Like sometimes the technology might be developed for a few years, but then some sort of zeitgeist will happen where a bunch of factors come together where it's exactly the thing that's needed to solve a specific problem, and then it takes off. So it could be something like that as well. Yeah, there's an example actually in a great article I found the other day where he was talking about how when you look at the hard drive, it was developed in like the 50s, the concept of the hard drive, and then when the first hard drives come out in the at 60s or 70s, forgive me, please, pedantic people, I don't have the dates perfectly memorized. The hard drives were getting, like, as they first came out, the commercial hard drives, we were getting, like, a couple megabytes or whatever a year for, like, 20 years or something. And then all of a sudden, we started getting, like, 50 megabytes to, to 100 to 250 to 500 to a gigabyte, to 10 gigabytes to 50 gigabytes to terabyte, you know, and it was going very quickly, right? And really, that's kind of a stigmoid curve, if you look at it, and that's that kind of like classic S-curve or flat S-curve. It's not a perfect S-curve. That's probably the wrong description. It's almost like going up a hill that it flattens out. And the first part is that breakthrough. It's really low and flat, very hard to make movement along it. And then you start to have enough different breakthroughs kind of coming together and interrelating that people who are not necessarily the creators, the inventors can start to look at, understand, and go, oh, I know how to make that better. Let it take my classic engineering skills or coding skills, and I'm going to change the material or the, the sort function or whatever, and I'm going to make this faster. And all of a sudden, I'm going to, and I'm going to stitch it together into a library. And I'm, all of a sudden, that starts to like move faster. And you, you have this sort of rapid explosion of progress for a period of time. And then all of a sudden, as you get further up the sigmoid curve, you start to run into trouble. You've had all these big breakthroughs, and it seems like it's going to never end. But then you start to find the limitations of the technology and the progress starts to slow down. Like each new innovation, it's still happening, but it's taking longer to get there as you go up the curve. And then you start to hit this point of diminishing returns where you're just not going to get anywhere. And any incremental progress is painful and long, and it starts to flatten out again. And then you need a new technology or a new paradigm kind of to fix things. That's the way that it works. It's the way that it works in all things. Yeah, it reminds me of the Cambrian explosion theory of evolution, how it doesn't happen kind of in this, you know, linear progression, but in these long periods of seeming stagnation and then just insane jumps where a lot of new organisms are evolved. And I think it's the same with technology where for a long time, it seems like almost nothing is happening. And then suddenly a bunch of factors come together and very rapid change happens for a while and then it flattens out again. And again, going with the same analogy, this is why your strategy of investing in a bunch of different iterations of the same thing is valuable because you don't know during that rapid change process which thing is going to survive. Right. And, and I encourage people to get rid of your biases. You see all these people who are like, oh, EOS is my thing. Screw Ethereum or, or Ethereum's it. You know, EOS is for suckers. And you're like, this is nonsense. Like, you have no idea which one of these is going to take off. You just think you do. And so forget it. Right. It's like I, I own a bunch of coins that I don't I think there are red flags all over the project. Right. But they may overcome those red flags. I have no idea. I don't know who the winners are going to be. And so I'm just trying to pick the ones that seem to have some level of momentum or at least some code and some energy around it, if you will. And I'll let fate take its hand. I, I'm not going to pretend I know which ones are going to take off and which ones are going to fail. It, again, there's so many factors that could lead up to it. You might have the best idea. And it doesn't mean that you take off because, you know, you have a bunch of infighting with the founders or something, or you just can't solve the one problem you need to solve. There's a million things that can go wrong. Any finishing words of wisdom that you want to leave people with? Here's what I, I will say. Please read my blog. I put a lot of time and effort into it. It's something I care about. I have a philosophy of taking open source to the idea level. I worked in open source for a long time in the software level. And I think there's an opportunity now to take open source to the business level and to the idea level. And so I give away all kinds of business ideas and concepts and trading secrets. And some people say that it's crazy to do that, but I get so much back from that. All my wisdom is out there for people to consume. 
And I give away all the business ideas and concepts because I want 50 people working on these things. I don't want to do one thing my whole life. I don't, I don't want to just work for 10 years on the same idea. I have a million, I have a zillion ideas. If I lived another, you know, 30 years, I'd have, I, I would never be able to do even a fraction of the ideas that I have. So I just, I've taken this idea of just open sourcing all of my knowledge. And I find that it comes back to me in spades. It's people will look at it. They'll think about it in a fresh way that I haven't. They'll suggest a book I haven't heard of or a, a flaw in my math or a different tweak to an indicator to make it more effective. To me, it's the greatest thing uh, that I've ever done. And I love putting my knowledge out there for people. I used to think about it in a very closed way, like a very zero sum game, like that the pie was fixed of wealth and knowledge and experience. And I had to go take somebody's pie and it's just wrong. It's totally wrong. The pie is growing and the best thing you can do is give away your pie to somebody who already has pie. Believe it or not, as counterintuitive, as insane as that sounds, it's pie just comes back to you. <laughs> it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. And it has been a life-changing experience for me over the last few years. And uh, it's been wonderful. I've been able to travel the world on other people's dime. I've been able to give great talks, meet fantastic people from rich to poor, geniuses and creative folks and people who I admire. I once had a really poor concept of wealth in that I thought that you could only get there by being a snake and a cheat. And you certainly can. There are people who have done that. Uh, but to me, there's another way and that's creating value for other people and being humble and being giving. Nobody achieves this kind of perfect Buddha balance all the time, but I have met a number of people late in my life who've been very successful by creating value for others. And that's what I'm trying to do now. If I, I wish that I had met those folks when I was younger because I felt like it poisoned my understanding of money and, and wealth creation. And now I have, I believe, the correct understanding of how you do things. And that's really just shining brightly and giving your gift to the world because it comes back to you a thousandfold. All right, that's it for this episode. To get the show notes, go to cryptoradio.io slash three. To play blockchain games from our sponsor, BitGuild, go to cryptoradio.io slash play. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to cryptoradio.io slash start. If you like our podcast, you can subscribe, share, and follow us on social media and leave us a rating and review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. You can find all those links at cryptoradio.io slash start. And finally, if you want to be a sponsor of our show, go to cryptoradio.io slash sponsor. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.